Would you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John? Gospel of John chapter 7 as we return to our journey through this Gospel. Uh, we last left off at, at the end of chapter 6 uh, in, uh, at the end of November. And today we're picking it back up. And uh, you'll notice in your worship guide that the title is Jesus versus the World. And I want to offer a bit of a clarification on that title very quickly because it is very easy for us in our culture to develop an us versus them mentality about just about everything where we create and we draw these lines around who is in our camp and who is in the other camp. And what we really mean there is we're right and they're wrong, right? That's really what us versus them is. And, and so I, I don't want to say, well, Jesus is, is, is creating this hostile us versus them reality. But I do want to say that in this passage today, we will begin looking at not just not that Jesus is drawing the lines, but that we are the ones who have drawn our lines. We have, are the ones who have created an us versus God mentality. And that is what Jesus has come to address. And so we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 7 and go and read all the way down to verse 24. So would you stand as we read God's word, please? John chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee, since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. The Jewish festival of shelters was near. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see your works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus told them, my time has not yet arrived, but your time is always at hand. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Go up to the festival yourselves. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said these things, he stayed in Galilee. After his brothers had gone up to the festival, then he also went up, not openly, but secretly. The Jews were looking for him at the festival and saying, where is he? And there was a lot of murmuring about him among the crowds. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he's deceiving the people. Still, nobody was talking publicly about him for fear of the Jews. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. Then the Jews were amazed and said, how is this man so learned since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but it's from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You have a demon, the crowd responded. Who's trying to kill you? I performed one work, and you were all amazed, Jesus answered. This is why Moses has given you circumcision, not that it comes from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. You may be seated. So from this passage, there are three juxtapositions that I want to I point out to you this morning, but let's explain what's going on. A feast of the Feast of Shelters, also called the Feast of Tabernacle, Tabernacles, that's not a word I'm going to say very well, even though I should since I've got one in the middle of town, uh, or also initially called the Feast of Ingathering. That has different names, but this is the feast of of booths also it was one of the three major feasts that that uh that jews were required if they were able to travel to the temple in jerusalem uh and, and it was a commemoration one it was a celebration of the end of the harvest year the agricultural year had ended and they were celebrating what god had done for them in the harvest but it was also a memorial a reminder of God's provision to the people in their wilderness wanderings in the book of Exodus. It was a week-long celebration where they would build these shanties or shacks or uh, uh, kibbutz out in, 
out of town and they would stay there. It was kind of like a camp out. If you were ever in Boy Scouts growing up, imagine a, a, a wall tent. You remember the big canvas wall tents that we used to have to do that somehow were held up by three poles, some rope and prayer? All right? They would make these shelters and they would, many people would stay in them for the whole week. It was a reminder of God, our people did this for 40 years and you took care of us the whole way. It was a celebration of God's provision, not just in the harvest for the year, but also throughout generations, and most notably, epitomized in the wilderness wanderings. So it's in the midst of this festival where people are supposed to be celebrating the provision and goodness and faithfulness of God that we find Jesus beginning to outline how he is different from the world. The first one is just in his private interaction with his brothers before the festival started. His brothers come to him and say, if you really are God, if you want everybody to know that you're God, why don't you go up and show off? Why don't you go up and make yourself known to everybody? Why don't you get, why don't you stand on top of the temple and show everybody just how amazing you are? That sounds familiar. It sounds a little bit like the temptation of Satan in the desert, right? If you really are God, why don't you, why don't you do some tricks? Why don't you perform for the people? And we know this might not sound, some of us might go, well, that makes sense, right? Jesus wants to be seen by people. He, he wants to actually, he came to be a light in the darkness. And so, yeah, why does the light go into the darkness? But we see here in this parenthetical statement in verse 5 that their statement was not made out of an encouragement to, for Jesus to go and obey the will of the Father. Their statement is based out of a lack of faith. For even his brothers did not believe in him. They were saying, Jesus, if you really are who you say you are, prove it. Prove it. Do a trick for us. We got a puppy for Christmas. Coincidentally, we're also selling a puppy now. I'm just kidding. We're not. He's a good dog, right? He's a good puppy dog. And the girls... Listen, it's either a puppy or a kid. You pick. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You see what they have to put up with? He's a good puppy dog, and we are working on training this one because we didn't train our previous dog, and we haven't trained any of our children, so we thought, let's try something new. So we're working with the dog to make him to be sit and patient and wait for us to say that it's time to eat and those kinds of things. And I am ashamed to say this, But all too often, we treat Jesus like a puppy. Sit. Stay. Roll over. Hear my prayer. Give me what I want. Do a trick for me, Jesus. That's what his brothers were doing, and that is a lack of faith. Yes, God will demonstrate himself to you. God has clearly demonstrated his invisible nature and divine power through all of creation. And God says, you ask and I'll give it to you. But that still means that we have to approach him, not as people who are owed anything, but as recipients of grace and those who have been invited into his presence rather than tiny little tyrants demanding something from a God who owes them something. That is a position of a lack of faith. That's a position of someone who has not understood or has forgot exactly who they're talking to. Jesus' brothers didn't know who they were talking to. They, it was just some sibling rivalry at this point. They did not believe. And here's the first difference between Jesus and the world. The world demands things work according to its desires. But Jesus operates according to the Father's desires. Because what is Jesus' response? Jesus says, my time has not yet arrived, but your time is always at hand. You see the juxtaposition? You may think, well, it's just about his brothers, but that's not who Jesus is talking about. He says, the world cannot hate you. Why? Because they're a part of it. They are a part of the world. Those who are outside of a reconciled, redeemed relationship with God through faith. They are apart from God. They are a part of the world. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Go up to the festival yourselves. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. 
What is Jesus saying? He says, you can demand things of me all you want, but you are not who I answer to. Jesus says, I don't answer to the whims of the world. I answer to the pleasure of my Father. It's, it's a matter of whose desires govern us. This is what Jesus says countless times throughout his ministry. This is what the New Testament tells us. This is what the Old Testament tells us. Those who have been reconciled to God through faith are governed no longer by their own selfish desires. They answer to a God who has freed them from the slavery to sin. And yes, our desires are inherently sinful without Christ. And even after we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we see the Apostle Paul clearly wrestling with this. He says he calls himself a wretched man, that the things that he wants to do are the things he he doesn't do, and the things he doesn't want to do are the things he finds himself doing the most. Sound familiar? This wrestling match that seems to be perpetual in our lives. And Jesus says that those who are a part of him, those who are a part of the Father... They are governed by God's desires, increasingly so. Jesus is perfect. He is God in the flesh. So he doesn't have this internal wrestling match that we do. He's perfect. He doesn't feel the the guilt and the worry of what other people are going to think of him. The world says jump, and Jesus says, you're not the boss of me. He says, my time hasn't come. I don't answer to your timetable. I don't have to do things the way that you demand that I do them. Because the world was looking for a different kind of Messiah. Even those who say they knew God will find out later on that they didn't know God at all. They just knew the words of God, but not the God who gave them the word. And they were expecting the Messiah to do certain things. And this Messiah did none of the things the way they thought they should be done. And Jesus says, he doesn't operate like that. He doesn't say how high when the world says jump. But this is the reality. Is that there is a difference between Jesus and his followers and the world in this aspect. God says that there are things that are good and things that are evil. And we do not get to negotiate on what those things are. God says that there are certain times for certain things. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how anxiously we pine or contrive different scenarios in our heart and mind, we must align ourselves with God's timetable rather than our own. This week we've been trying to walk through some difficult times with some friends. And I love these people dearly. And this week, I have contemplated slashing tires, finding people in dark parking lots. I've tried all kinds of things to get the right thing done. My inner thug has come out at points. I'm mad. I'm mad at some people who are doing bad things in Jesus' name. It drives me crazy. I can't tell you how many text messages and emails I have typed up only for the Holy Spirit to say, you delete that, you fool delete that. You're not going to fix anything. You're going to make things worse. Just get you flying off at the handle. What what difference do you think you're going to make? You're not God. I've had to be reminded this week of I cannot operate according to the basis desires that bubble up in me at the worst times. I must rely on the desires of my father as revealed in the word as Jesus did. Jesus could have gone up and he could have made a spectacle of himself he could have he could have put on the greatest show ever seen on earth at this festival and some people would have had an emotional reaction to it some people would have been marvel they would have marveled at the wondrous works he did but we already know that the marvel at the wondrous works wears off So many of the same people have seen Jesus do different miracles. And what is the result that we see in this passage? They don't marvel at it anymore. Now they're mad at him. Jesus mentions a healing towards the end of the passage we read. He says, I healed a man on the Sabbath and you're mad at me for it. You were amazed at first, but that amazement has given way to fury. That was the healing of the man on the Sabbath by the pool of Bethesda. 
It was on the Sabbath. He told him to get up and walk. He'd been there for four decades almost. You see, the amazement, if that's all you have, will eventually give way. Your desires will overcome your, the awestruck nature, that feeling that you once have. Christ, following Jesus must be more than a feeling of a gaped jaw and wide eyes. It must be rooted in faith and who Jesus is, not just the spectacles that you think he should perform. It has to be about Jesus. It can't just be about what he can do for you, how he can astonish you, because that's our base desire. Our desires, God, prove yourself to me. And God has already done everything he has to to prove himself to you. God has already done the greatest thing he can ever do to you by sending Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to die on the cross for your sins and raise him from the grave to walk amongst people for six weeks, appearing before as many people as 500 people at a time. What more do you want from God? You want him to make the mean people in your life to go away? You want him to make you feel better? I understand that those aren't bad desires. But we have to understand, we have to start submitting ourselves to the desires of the Father. And sometimes the desires of the Father don't match ours. I know that's a spoiler. Sometimes God doesn't want the same things you want. Sometimes what God wants for you and for me don't line up. And that's a good thing. Because God is good in all that He does. He is faithful in everything He brings you into. And He is kind to work in you through every situation, believer, so that you might look more like Christ. And that is the greatest good that exists, is that we be transformed to look more like Jesus. The world demands things operate according to its desires, and Jesus operates according to the de desires of the Father. One last illustration. Think about it. As Jesus hung on the cross, people were jeering at him. Why don't you just come down off the cross? If you really are God, just save yourself. Think about what's happened, what happens if Jesus entertains that thought. There is no salvation. There's no salvation. There's no atonement for our sin through the death of the righteous lamb. There's no resurrection as a guarantee for eternal life. And oh, by the way... Jesus would have disobeyed the will of the Father because the will of the Father was to send the Son to die, to be crushed for our iniquity. Jesus, to the praise of His glory, does not answer to us. He answers to the Father perfectly and completely aligned with His will. What's the next distinction that Jesus draws between Himself and the world? He says that the world hates Jesus. The world hates him, but Jesus loves the world. Look at verse 7. He tells his brothers, the world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Jesus says something very, very simple here. The reason the world still hates Jesus, it's not because you're imperfect. Those are maybe evidence that they have that, that the world, those who are outside of Christ may use against us. But at the root of it, you could obey God's word perfectly and guess what? They would still hate Jesus. Why? Because Jesus uncovers the wickedness of lost mankind. And we don't like being found out. We don't like our sin being uncovered. We do not like being exposed for what we really are without Christ. We do not like being people in need of a Savior and having the whole world that we need a Savior. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to be righteous in the eyes of other people. We want to keep our facade that we have it all together. We want to pretend that we don't need God. And Jesus strips all of that away. Hebrews 4 tells us that the Word of God, the Word of God is living and active. And it splits us wide open and lays us bare before God. There is no hiding from Jesus. And the world hates it. 
The world hates being exposed. And accordingly, they hate the one who exposes it. But Jesus, we see from John chapter 3 and countless other places, that Jesus' response to the world's hatred is love. Not a warm, sappy, saccharine, rom-com kind of love. But a deep, eternal, patient, perfect love. A love that is forgiving, yes. A love that keeps no record of wrongs, but a love that also does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. A love that will say what you're doing will shipwreck your soul. What you're doing is going to burn your life down. That's love. Love is saying, listen, that that way is false. This way is true. Please repent, turn, believe, and be saved. See, this is why I started the sermon with that little diatribe about avoiding an us versus them mentality. Because Jesus, in his earthly ministry, did not say, well, if you people don't like me, I don't like you. He said, you people don't like me because I tell you the truth, but it's exactly what you need, so I will endure to the end of my Father's will. He endured. And that's love. Love hopes all things, bears all things, and endures all things. Even hatred. We have to choose to love the world just as Jesus did. It's very easy for us to build our our own walls and kind of insulate ourselves from what what we perceive to be increasing wickedness in the world around us. But remember the testimony of Scripture is that there's nothing new under the sun. We're not seeing new kinds of wickedness. We're just seeing the same wickedness celebrated in maybe different ways. And the response of the Christian is not to say, well, I'm just going to hunker down and wait for Jesus to come back. Because that's not what Jesus did. Jesus ran into the hatred. He ran into the darkness. And he gave them truth. And he lived an exemplary life. He loved those who hated him. He gave them truth. And they reviled him for it. And Paul tells us that we too were counted among those people who reviled him for it. We were dead in our sin and trespasses, but God who is rich in mercy saved us through the gracious gift of faith. The world hates Jesus. But Jesus loves them. He loved us and brought us into his family. And we're sent out with the same mission, the same work, for the same purpose. And lastly, this morning, the last juxtaposition that we see is that the world uses God's word to push people down, but Jesus uses God's word to raise people up. Jump down to verse 16. Jesus says, they, they start to question How is this guy so good at everything? How is he teaching so well? How does he know so much? Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but it's from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You have a demon, the crowd responded. Who's trying to kill you? I performed one work and you are all amazed, Jesus answered. This is why Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it comes from Moses, but from the Father. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. And if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. Jesus shifts. And when we talk about the world, it's very easy for us to think of all the the sinful deeds that are done in darkness that Ephesians 5 says that shouldn't even be named among believers. It's not fitting for children of light to talk about what goes on in darkness. 
It's very easy for us to picture moral and spiritual boogeymen hiding in the shadows. But Jesus then shines the light on those people who are in the temple day in and day out, who know God's word better than anybody there except for Jesus himself. He shines the light on the religious people and he starts to poke at them. He goes, you, you enforce the law of Moses on other people, but you yourself don't obey it. And he brings up the specific example of circumcision. Now, there was to be no work done on the Sabbath. It was supposed to be a time to keep holy, to, remind, uh, to be reminded of not just God's creative work, but also his restorative work in us, our dependence on him. Remember the Feast of Booths that they're there celebrating? It's all about dependence on God's provision and a celebration of God's provision. So now Jesus connects the Sabbath uh, to their falsehoods in the midst of this feast. And he says, even if God provides for circumcision to be allowed on the Sabbath so that the law won't be broken... How are you people mad at me that a man was healed on the Sabbath? And by the way, they were mad at that guy. If you go back and look at John chapter 5 in the first few verses, they corner him and say, why are you carrying your mat? It's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be doing any work. And the man who's been paralyzed for four decades is like, I, I don't know, that guy back there told me to get up and walk, and I can walk now. He didn't seem to be too concerned with the Sabbath. He seemed more concerned that his life had just been radically transformed by a word from this man who didn't even know who he was. He didn't know Jesus' name at all. He just said, some guy came and told me to get up and walk. And I did. And oh, by the way, thank you for caring. He didn't say this. This is just my parenthetical conversation. And oh, by the way, you guys have walked past me a hundred times. I'm glad you feel nice for me. No, they immediately jump on him. They use God's word to hold down somebody who for the first time in maybe their entire life is actually finally standing up spiritually. He finally has hope. And there they are to pounce on him to say, ah, no, 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 you're doing this walking thing wrong. You picked the wrong day to be healed. The world is not just people who revile the word of God. The world also encompasses people who know the word of God very well and use it to destroy people's lives. Because just because you're quoting scripture doesn't mean you love Jesus. All kinds of evil things have been perpetrated on mankind by people who use the name of Christ to do it. I was baffled whenever I was probably 14, 15 years old. I was a brand new believer. Um, I didn't know much uh, about the Bible um, because I thought, hey, I, Jesus saved me and I'm going to church. I, I think I'm doing everything I need to do, which was not even remotely the case. But I remember, uh, you know, watching a very educational program called Jerry Springer. <laughs> Listen, you couldn't get cable where we lived. At least that's what my parents told me. And so, so I was watching the, you know, the 90s version of TLC and uh, I was watching Jerry Springer, and there, was, there were KKK members on there. At least people pretending to be, I don't know. And, you know, I was shocked whenever they quoted a Bible verse to justify their hatred. John 8, 44, I think. You are of, the father, the de you are of your father, the devil. Talking about Jewish people. So that was their hatred. That was the biblical justification for anti-Semitism. You see how easy, and I'm going to flip my Bible open going, what in the world? And I read it, and then I read the sentences around that, and I'm like, well, Jesus isn't, Jesus is Jewish, right? He's a Jew. He doesn't hate Jews. Anyway, it's very easy for us to have our views, and then retrofit Scripture into them. And instead of using Scripture as a, as a balm for the soul, we use it as a club to bludgeon people with. Now, Scripture is a sword. Scripture is described as a sword in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it, I already mentioned that it splits us wide open. I'm not saying the Word of God never, never stings us. It never pierces us. 
but it never leaves us with God's intent is not to split you wide open so that you lay on the ground suffering. It's so that he can split you open, remove what needs to be removed and put you back together whole and healthy and restored. People who simply want to use God's word to cut people down. You need to stay far away from those people because they are missing a key component called redemption. It's very easy to get caught up in the wrath and the fury of it all, but the gospel doesn't end in wrath and fury. It ends in grace and mercy. And the, the religious leaders here, they're holding the Sabbath and all these other restrictions over the people. And Jesus points out to them, you're using God's word to pass judgment on people unrighteously. That's what he says. Instead of stop a judge, stop, verse 24, stop judging according to outward appearances, rather judge according to righteous judgment. Did they have scripture on their side? Yeah, the Bible says don't, don't work. The law says no work shall be performed on the Sabbath. They could quote a Bible verse but they missed the point of that Bible verse. And they couldn't see it. Their judgment was askew. They had, they had God-ordained, inspired words, and they were using it in an unrighteous manner. And Jesus says, I am not like you. I understand what the law was intended to do for us. That the law was intended to show us the holiness of God and our inability to live up to that standard. The law was never intended to be your savior. The law was intended to show you that you needed one. And people who use the Bible to simply destroy people's lives, to hold them down, to keep a spiritual boot on their neck, they do not know the gospel. Yes, sin exists in this world. Yes, the church is supposed to give people truth just like Jesus did. Yes, we will be hated for it, but we should be hated for living and loving and teaching like Jesus, not be hated for being jerks. And now, you know, there's a difference between someone just not liking what you said and you giving them a reason not to like how you said it. I've used this illustration before, but I've heard it plenty of times in my life. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. And I'm not going to say that's happened in my marriage, but it has, right? The tone that you did. Or maybe whenever I try to maybe point my children in a holier way of living and they look at me and say, well, you don't do that. And I'm like, well, you can just shut up. <laughs> You're not supposed to be seeing that part. <laughs> the word of God is... Yes, it pierces, but it also restores. And Jesus says that how we use the Word of God will likely be a good indicator of where exactly we are in our relationship with God. Are we a part of this religious world that we're closer to Jesus, maybe in our own eyes, but we're not actually with Jesus? That we're this holier-than-thou part of the lost people. And guess what? Doesn't mean Just because you think you're holier-than-thou doesn't mean you're actually holy. There's not a special section of eternal destruction assigned for people who know the Bible more than the other lost people. And Jesus says the Word of God is intended to provide righteous judgment to all people. It's not intended to be used to just press people into these exterior superficial judgments that don't actually care about the person because you see the word of god is about people it's about god who is a personal god sending his son in a human body to walk among people to teach people the truth to declare the truth of the gospel to people so that people might be rescued from the wrath of God brought against them because of their sin it's about people the word of God is never just an academic 
expression. It is never just about you quoting something. It's never about you simply getting through an evangelistic outline so you can check a box that you are evangelistic. It's about the person or people sitting in front of you that need hope, that need to know that sin is real, that need to know there is a God who judges it, that needs to know there is also a God who forgives it through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Word of God must be our source of not just conviction, but also of restoration. Because that's what Jesus is, and that's what he uses the Word of God to do. There is a difference between Jesus and the world. Next week, we're going to continue talking about this on a, on a more personal level, about how Jesus is the dividing line. He is the only dividing line that matters in the, amongst humanity. But this morning... I just want to encourage you while we pray and sing here in just a few moments that you would ask God to examine your heart. That you would ask God to show you whether you are a part of the world or whether you are a part of Christ. Whether you have put your faith in church attendance and, and, and sitting under preaching or coming to Sunday school or whether you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. Would you ask Him to examine your life to show you whether you are lining up with Jesus' example or the example of Jesus' brother? Maybe you're here today and you are waiting for God to show up and show off so that you might finally believe. And I simply want to encourage you. Would you look at what God has already done for you? The first off, you're here today to hear truth. That's not coincidence. God's provided you the opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel would you believe would you know that god loves you so much that he gave his one and only son that if you would believe in him you would never you would be rescued from eternal death into eternal life would you trust that god judges your sin but that he also forgives it through jesus christ would you put your faith in the resurrected savior this morning would you turn from yourself and your own desires and turn towards Jesus? And maybe you already are a believer, but you have been wandering. You look more like the world than what you thought you would at this point. I want to encourage you that God is your father and may say, son or daughter, there's lots for us to work on, but he hasn't written you off. He's not disowned you. He's not cast you out. God is a patient God. He is a good father. And he is not done with you. Press on. Press into Christ. And know that there is still time through the power of God and the power of the Spirit for you to become the man or woman of God that He wants you to be. All you must do is simply say, all right, Jesus, I'm coming home. I'm done wandering. I want to come back. I want to return to faithfulness. I want to look more like Jesus and less like the world that I've been saved out of. Would you pray with me, please? Father, during this time, would your... Would your spirit cause the word of God to, to move in our hearts and our minds to help us to see how we can follow Jesus more closely. Father, for those in this room that are not followers of Jesus, they've never turned from their sin and their own desires and turned towards you and turned towards Christ by faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God, I pray this morning would be the day of their salvation. Father, they may have questions. They may not understand everything. God, would you help them to know that that's not the prerequisite. The prerequisite is not that they understand everything about you. It's that they understand that they're a sinner and they need salvation. And you are a God who offers it through Jesus. Would you help them to see that, to confess that, and to believe that? Father, would you help them to stand boldly and say, I'm a child of God now through faith in Christ. Just as Andrew and Mason did this morning through their baptism. Father, would you help those who are, who are trying? They're trying to follow you, but it seems like they can't get traction. Father, I pray that they would press on. God, that they would not give up, that they would, they would not grow weary in doing what is good, that in due time they will reap a harvest. Father, I pray that if they're looking for a church home, that they would know that there are plenty of, plenty of good ones in this community. God, that, that they should commit and grow alongside other disciples, other flawed people who are trying to stumble forward in Christ. Father, for those who are waiting for you to show off, they're waiting for an angel to rip the skies open or 
you to appear at the foot of their bed, Father, would they see that Christ has done everything that needs to be done for them to be rescued. Father, help us to leave this place as people ready and willing to worship you in the midst of a hostile world. May we be lights of mercy and grace and peace and patience in a world that knows none of those things truly. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.